When I first started handicapping UFC fights, it was a very daunting experience to come up with my own number on a particular fight and basically bet anything that was above that number, anything that I thought was value. But I do think that if you're willing to put in the effort, like, like anything in life, it's a skill that can be learned. One thing that allowed me to improve my handicapping over time was reading this book, Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction. And what this book does is it takes a group of forecasters, not with anything to do with sports betting, just people who forecast global events, get them into a project, and basically every day they were forecasting or predicting when certain things in the world were gonna happen, if they were gonna happen, all these kinds of things. And it allowed me to take you know, what they learned from predicting global events and applying that to sports betting. So overall, the book explains who were the most successful and unsuccessful forecasters and what kind of personality traits and, and techniques they used to make them so successful. And like I said, it was a game changer for my handicapping. So this video is really just based around giving you guys four things that I learned from this book and how you can apply them to your own sports betting. But before I get into today's video, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and check out some of the other great videos we have on this channel at the end of the video. It is a scam when you don't allow everyone to operate on fair terms. We are the Roman Hoods of sports betting. We take something back from the rich bookies and enable our customers to beat them instead. My first tip for anyone starting handicapping is to stay away from listening to sports pundits, especially the most popular ones on television. If you think about it this way, if you're a producer looking to hire talent to speak about an English Premier League game, let's just say, are you going to hire someone that's got a brilliant mind for football but is quite dull and, and not really that entertaining to listen to in front of the camera? Or are you going to hire someone that, yeah, they might not have the greatest footballing mind, they might not, you know, see the game as perfectly as some, but they're bloody entertaining, they're a little bit controversial, maybe they're a little bit funny too. Which one are you going to hire? You're probably going to hire the one that's the most entertaining because he's going to attract, or she's going to attract the most viewers, uh, or most, the biggest audience. Um, whereas, you know, listening to that guy that might have a brilliant mind for football, but he's pretty dull and, and not very entertaining, <clears throat> he's not going to he's not going to attract as, as big of an audience. Unfortunately, accuracy doesn't really sell on television, but entertainment really does. And, and pundits are not hired because they're a, they're a master at predicting how a football game is going to turn out. Put it this way: How many times do you hear, uh, let's just say, Gary Neville? for example, say that Manchester United have a 72% chance of winning a football game this weekend. He would never say anything like that. He might say something like, Manchester United should win today, or they probably will win. They're not really accurate markers to go off if you're someone in the betting markets. Look at some of how the numbers are moving on a sports betting market, some of the sharp markets. They're getting down to finite percentages on, on who's going to win uh, a certain game. So, you know, some a, a, a pundit saying that they think United are probably going to win or they should win, what does that mean percentage-wise? It could mean a 55% chance or it could mean a 85% chance. We have no idea. The other thing to add on top of that is they're never accountable for their predictions. So if someone says United is going to win this weekend and they lose or they draw, do, do, do we ever go back and, and, and tally up all the predictions these pundits have made and, you know, looked at their record and seen how accurate they actually are? And a great thing this book found was that the more famous the expert was or the, the more, more famous the forecaster was in this project, the less successful they were with their predictions overall, which kind of highlights exactly what I was saying before. People gain fame for being entertaining, not accurate. My second tip for improving your handicapping is to work like a scientist and try and always prove yourself wrong and why your number or the way you've handicapped the game could be completely wrong. Scientists are always trying to work against their hypothesis to see what could convince them that they are wrong about a certain thing. 
if you can't provide another reason why a, a certain team or player can win the game, then it's a sign that you've grown way too attached to your belief. Because if that was the case, then the other team, or one of the teams, sorry, would be 1.00 in odds. In other words, a 100% chance of winning. The most successful handicappers out there are always searching for outside views or differing opinions that they can synthesize into their own price. So if you get to a stage where you price Manchester United at 1.8 this weekend, but you can get 2.2 out there, that's a huge price discrepancy for such a popular, you know, massive market like the English Premier League. There's probably something that you are missing. There's no way that you could have that big of difference in your pricing for such a huge market like the EPL. In these scenarios, I think it's important to listen to those people who disagree with you, who have a completely different perception on the game. I know that at times it can be hard to have productive conversations with people who are on the complete opposite, opposite side to you in terms of how a game might play out. But do your best to have a productive conversation and really listen in to what they're saying. And like I said before, try and synthesize that into your own price. Whatever you do, do not rush to judgment. Try and stay as analytical as possible and wide-eyed to any perception outside of yours. Tip number three is embedding open-mindedness. And it kind of follows on from my last point on trying to prove yourself wrong. And it's trying to work your handicapping in a way that it's it becomes automatic for you to always be contradicting yourself or always looking at the other side of the picture. So for some handicappers, they'll be writing notes on a particular game, let's just say, and coming up with a, a pros and cons of, of a certain team or both teams, and then trying to embed that into a price. And ways you can improve your reasoning writing, let's just say, when you come up with an overall picture on a game is the language you're using. And what was most interesting about the project that was performed in this book was the, the certain correlation between the wording of reasoning for certain forecasters and how they performed. They found that people that use uh, writing or, or terms like furthermore or, or moreover, words that are used to try and really prove your point on a certain forecasting, you know, forecasting a certain global event, were they were the most unsuccessful forecasters as they were really trying to prove or really trying to, you know, explain their argument as to why this certain thing might happen. When you're using these kind of terms like furthermore and moreover, you're forcing yourself to look at one side of the argument and you're not looking at the other side of the fence, which is a major problem. And the funny thing was, is these people who use this kind of language performed even worse in topics that they specialized in. So for example, if a forecaster specialized in financial markets, they performed even worse in those topics because that was an area they saw that they specialized in and they really honed in on their certain beliefs, you know, using language like furthermore and moreover. So it, you know, it, it just shows that even if you specialize in something and you don't look at the other side of the fence, you'll really struggle. But the forecasters that were most successful in this project were the ones that inserted language into their reasoning like although, however, on the other hand. So it almost forced them to be pragmatic and, and look at the other side of the fence. So as a handicapper, if you're ever presented with a certain game or match, try and use this kind of language like however, although, on the other hand, as it, it forces you to think about how the other player, how the other team could win this match. My last tip for handicappers out there is to work in teams. Now this is obviously very hard to do as most people are kind of sitting in front of their computer by themselves and, and coming up with opinions on games by themselves. But if you can create relationships in sports betting uh, and, and form a team of really good opinions, then it's only going to improve your own betting. It's a similar concept to beating the closing line. If you can beat the closing line at a sharp bookmaker like Pinnacle, it essentially means you're beating the wisdom of the crowd. So if this weekend Manchester United closed at 2.1 in odds, but you got 2.3, the wisdom of the crowd thought, or you know, the majority of people with the sharpest minds in betting thought that uh, Manchester United's true odds was 2.1 or a little bit over that and you got it at 2.3. So that shows that you were able to beat the crowd. So one of the great things they did in this book was look at 
how teams of super forecasters or, or the best forecasters in this project would go together, working together. Instead of working individually, would they be able to improve their predictions if they put all these 10 great minds, let's just say, into a group and create what you can call it a super team, I guess, and see if they could outdo their own performances by working as a team. And funny enough, yes, they did perform better. In the first year, they got just a random group of people together that were either good forecasters or bad forecasters, and even them working together, they performed 23% better than the best individuals. But then the second year, they got the best uh, forecasters together, put them in teams, and they were able to outperform individual scores by 50%. So this kind of proves this, a similar thing in the sports betting world. Let's just say you're a great sports better. You do a 5%, you've got a 5% edge against the market. You've got a return on investment of 5%. Imagine if you got a bunch of 5% guys, put them in the same room together. I know that's probably hard to do in a lot of circumstances, but you know, if you're all around the world, you can jump on a Zoom call, message each other constantly, etc., etc put those 5% together and maybe you can eliminate some of the bad bets you put together and take your ROI from 5% to 7.5 just through a simple chat about a certain match or a certain fight, game, whatever you want to call it. The key thing with teamwork though is communication. You can't work in a team environment where it turns into arguing. You have to be able to communicate effectively, listen to the other sides, opinion and and be and disagree without being disagreeable if you get what i mean so trying to communicate effectively really synthesize all these thoughts into your own and have productive conversations and it's only going to improve your betting in the long run and that wraps up my four tips on how to improve your handicapping i highly recommend reading this book if you're serious about your sports betting handicapping uh, it, like I said, it's not exactly about sports betting, but you can take these tools that forecasters and, and people that make predictions use and hone it into your own sports betting. I think like anything, you're not going to be great at these once you first start or handicapping in general when you first start, but practice and repetition is really going to improve your handicapping over time. And the more time and effort you put into it, the more years you put into it, the better you're going to get at handicapping sports games. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like. Please subscribe to the channel. There's other great videos on our channel that you can probably get great use out of. And please click the bell so you get alerted to all the new content coming out on our channel. Cheers, guys.